Hello. Welcome to Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is Steve, and uh, welcome to Text Talks. Today we're going to be uh, following up on the companion piece, which was a story of an encounter with an angel during my childhood. And uh, we're going to talk about one of the stories of angel encounters in the Bible that is usually not mentioned today. I think you'll understand why as we go forward here. Okay. Instead of bouncing around, to, uh, looking at different passages today on a topic, what we're going to do is follow a particular story through the passages in the Bible. <clears throat> so, the story of Hagar's angel starts in Genesis 16. And I'm just going to read the passages today. Uh, because uh, if you're like me, when you're watching a video and the speaker says, now I want you to stop and go do such and such and then come back. I can never make myself do it. So just let's just read them together. I'm reading from the contemporary English version. Um, it's easier to understand. And since what we're looking at is a story, I'm wanting the story to flow well. So starting with verse 1 of chapter 16. Abraham's wife, Sarai, had not been able to have any children, but she owned a young Egyptian slave woman named Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has not given me any children. Sleep with my slave, and if she has a child, it will be mine. Abram agreed, and Sarai gave him Hagar to be his wife. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for ten years. Now, let's just think about this for a minute, okay? This is a story of slavery. And it's popular today that say, to say, well, slavery in the Bible was not like slavery in the United States in the 1800s. It wasn't nearly as abusive. But let's look at the elements that are contained just in these three verses. Number one, Hagar was Sarai's property. She owned her. Number two, the product that the slave produced, the results of their work, belonged to the master, or in this case, the mistress. And number three, in this case, the work was having sex with her husband. The product was a baby. So this slave is given to what we will learn later is an 80-something-year-old man to have, to have sex with, and if she gets pregnant, her child is to be taken away from her and owned by her mistress. Now, the concept of the verbal inspiration of Scripture is often verbalized like this. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Verbal inspiration, the concept that the words are inspired, makes it unnecessary to examine the content. And this has led to some horrible conclusions. This story is one of those horrible conclusions. In reading sermons from the early 1800s, right before the Civil War, this story was used as evidence to prove that the Bible supported the institution of slavery, not only the institution of slavery, but the sexual use of female slaves to produce children for the master. There's a reason we don't talk about this story very much, because it has leaves a very bad taste in people's minds. Okay. Critics have brought this, this story and its application up repeatedly as an example of the horrible abuses that Christianity can produce. And you know what? They're right. This is a story of horrible abuse. But this is Abraham and Sarah. That doesn't matter. This is a story of horrible abuse. 
If any employer today treated his employee this way, we would think it was horrible. That's about as close in American culture as we can come in an analogy. But that's what is being talked about here. Now, the critics point this out to say, see how horrible the Bible is? Okay, it even suggests, it, it even talks about this and never even reprimands Abraham. It never even says, this is horrible, this is horrible. Okay, yeah, and if you're operating under the assumption of verbal inspiration of Scripture, that's absolutely right. But if you look at the stories in the Bible as being put there to teach us lessons, instead of looking for sound bites to prove things, you find a deeper meaning in this story that is very, very powerful. Because this story makes visible how horribly Hagar was treated. And something key, even the midst of the horrible treatment she received at the father, hands of the father of the faithful, the mother of the faithful, God was there for Hagar. Paul in Romans 8.28 says that God is working in everything for good to those who love him. This story makes that visible. So let's go on from here, Verses uh, starting with verse 4. Later, when Hagar knew she was going to have a baby, she became proud and was hateful to Sarai. Then Sarai said to Abram, It's all your fault. I gave you my slave woman, but she's been hateful to me ever since you found, she found out she was pregnant. You have done me wrong, and you will have to answer to the Lord for this. And Abraham said, all right, she's your slave. You can do whatever you want with her. But Sarah began treating Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Hagar becomes pregnant and she turns the tables on Sarah. <laughs> Who's the favorite of Abraham? I'm going to have a baby. Oh, it's so nice to be pregnant, isn't it, Sarai? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't do that for you, Sarai. I'm pregnant. You know, one thing that I've learned in my lifetime, two wrongs never make a right. Justice that creates injustice is never justice. It never produces peace. It never produces reconciliation. It never ends the problem. All it does is perpetuate it because you done me wrong, you deserve what you get, becomes you done me wrong, you deserve what you get, becomes you done me wrong, you deserve what you get. And we start chasing the crazy cycle. So Sarai flees and let's continue the story starting with verse 7. Hagar stopped to rest at a spring in the desert on the road to Shur. And while she was there, the angel of the Lord came to her and asked, Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? She answered, I'm running away from Sarah, my owner. And the angel said, go back to Sarai and be her slave. Now the Hebrew here, that this translation translates as go back and be her slave. The Hebrew word there used there for be her slave is to humble oneself, to bow down, to be afflicted, to be humbled. All of those are, in, are usages of that word in Hebrew. So, it sounds like God is telling Hagar to go back and let the status quo exist. Is that really what he meant? Let's read on 
10 and 12, 10 through 12. I will give you a son who will be called Ishmael, because I have heard your cry for help. And later I will give you so many descendants that no one will be able to count them all. But your son will live far from his relatives. He'll be like a wild donkey fighting everyone and everyone fighting him. Ishmael. This is a word play. It means God will hear. And the word play is that in the sentence, he, uh, God says, he will be called Ishmael because I have heard your cry for help. He will be called God will hear because I, God, hear you. Reading on for verse 13. Hagar thought, have I really seen God and lived to tell about it? So from then on, she called him, God, the God who sees me. That's why people call the well between Kadesh and Barad, the well of the living one who sees me. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar gave birth to their son, and he named them Ishmael. The well of the living one who sees me. On the face of it, God tells Hagar to go back and not make, be, not make trouble. Be a good little slave. And in American history, that's what this story was used to teach. God commanded Hagar to go back into slavery, not to run away, not to rebel. But then we come to the well of the living one who sees me. This detail suggests to me that she did not return to the status quo. She went back and told her story. And enough people learned her story that people called the well where she make, made the angel the well of the living one who sees me. Sarai knew her story. Abram knew her story. Can you imagine what went on in Sarai's mind when Hagar came back and told of meeting an angel and God telling her to come back and humble herself and that he would make of her children a great nation? That's the same promise he had made to Abram. All of a sudden, Sarai would be having second, third, and fourth thoughts about being harsh and spiteful to this slave who was her husband's wife. Talk about a shot across the bows. Now, the story doesn't end here. Um, let's move forward to chapter 17, but we're going to skip on down to verse 15. No need going through the whole process of circumcision. Starting with verse 15. Abraham, your wife's name will now be Sarah instead of Sarai. I will bless her, and you will have a son by her. She will become the mother of nations, and some of her descendants will even be kings. Abraham bowed his face to the ground and thought, I am almost a hundred years old. How can I become a father? And Sarah is 90. How can she have a child? So he started laughing. And then he asked God, Why not let Ishmael inherit what you have promised me? But God answered, No, you and Sarah will have a son. His name will be Isaac, and I will make an everlasting promise to him and his descendants. I've heard what you've asked me to do for Ishmael, and so I will also bless him with many descendants. He will be the father of 12 princes, and I will make his family a great nation. But your son Isaac will be born about this time year, this time next year, and the promise I'm making to you and your family will be for him and his descendants forever. God finished speaking to Abram and then left. So Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. 13 years later, he's now 99, and during this 13 years, Ishmael has been his hope. Ishmael 
has been his son. Ishmael has been his heir apparent. Ishmael has been the one he has invested. All of his energy, all of his hopes and dreams have been invested in this child. And now God says, nope, Sarah is going to have a baby now. This shook Abram's world. Yes, he laughed because of the impossibility of fathering a child and of Sarah giving birth at 90 years of age. But he also laughed in shock and confusion. And his next question reveals that. Why not let Isaac or Ishmael be my heir? Don't abandon my son. Now the story picks up again in chapter 21. I'm going to go through some if, ands, or buts here. Um, but Isaac is finally born, starting with verse 1. The Lord was good to Sarah and kept his promise. Although Abraham was very old, and Sarah had a son exactly at the time God had said. Abraham named his son Isaac. And when the boy was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him just as the Lord had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born, and Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. Now everyone will laugh with me. Who would have dared to tell Abraham that someday I would have a child? But in his old age, I have given him a son. Now, the name Isaac means he laughs. Once again, it's a play on words. Abraham had laughed when God informed him. Sarah laughed when she was told that she was going to have a child in doubt. Abraham laughed in confusion. Now Sarah is laughing with joy and triumph, but someone else is going to be laughing soon. Starting with verse 21, verse 8, or chapter 21, verse 8. The time came when Sarah no longer had to, had to nurse Isaac. So a couple of years have passed by here. And on that day, Abraham gave a big feast. One day, Sarah noticed Hagar's son, Ishmael, playing. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that Egyptian slave woman and her son. I don't want him to inherit anything. It should all go to my son. Now, the word translated in this, tra this translation uh, playing, Ishmael playing. In other translations, you'll see, see it translated as mocking. And the Hebrew can be used in either way. It can be simple playing, or it can be playing in a mocking, teasing fashion. It really doesn't matter. Sarah took offense at what this teenage boy was doing. And whether she was angry because he was happy and joyful and she wanted her son to be the apple of his father's eye, the focus of everyone's attention, or whether she, Ishmael was making fun of Isaac and, um, you know, sibling rivalry going on here. It doesn't matter because Sarah chose to be spiteful in what she did next. Reading on from verse 11, Abraham was worried about Ish Ishmael. But God said, Abraham, don't worry about your slave woman and the boy. Just do what Sarah tells you. Isaac will inherit your family name. But the son of the slave woman is also your son. And I will make his descendants into a great nation. Now, I would like to propose to you that this is the first, bi first divorce recorded in the Bible. Conservative Christians really struggle with divorce in situations of abuse. And Jesus only approves divorce in one situation, adultery. And, this and they have a valid point. If you go looking for a sound bite in Scripture, Jesus in the testimony, or in the Sermon on the Mount, does say, 
divorce, save for the, the situation of adultery, results in adultery. If you remarry, you commit adultery. If somebody remarries the spouse that you divorce, they commit adultery. And now it's difficult to explain in our culture today uh, because there's always, I mean, there's always extenuating services, circumstances, etc. But that's not the point I'm trying to, trying to make here. When we expand our exploration of, ser- of scripture beyond sound bites, beyond verbal inspiration, and we start looking at the stories in the Bible as lessons for us to learn from, we discover here God commands Abraham to send away his wife and child. Divorce. Maybe we don't pay attention to this story because (laughs) Abraham is the one at the root of the problem. Abraham is the one who abused his position of power to impregnate his servant for his own purposes. Abram is the one who gives his wife permission to abuse Hagar in the first place. And now Abraham is the one who is sending his wife away into the wilderness, poorly prepared. But look at it this way. I think what God is really saying here is, Abraham, Sarah, this has gone on long enough. I am setting Hagar free from this situation. I will take care of her from now on. She's, he is liberating her from an impossible situation. Going on from verse, uh, starting with verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham gave Hagar an animal skin full of water and some bread. Now, the translation I'm reading says, then he put the boy on her shoulder. Yeah, well, they forgot to read the rest of the story. No, Uh, he put the water and bread on her shoulder and gave her the boy and sent them away. You don't put a 15-year-old boy on a woman's shoulder to carry out into the wilderness. They wandered around in the desert near Beersheba, and after they had run out of water, Hagar put her son under a bush. Then she sat down a long way off because she could not bear to watch him die, and she cried bitterly. When God heard the boy crying, the angel of God called to Hagar out to Hagar from heaven and said, Hagar, why are you worried? Don't be afraid. I've heard your son crying. Help him up and hold his hand because I will make him the father of a great nation. Then God let her see a well. So she went to the well and filled the skin with water, then gave some to her son. God blessed him at Ishmael, and as the boy grew older, he became an expert with his bow and arrows. He lived in the Paran Desert, and his wife chose an Egyptian woman for him to marry. See, Hagar doesn't know about the conversation between God and Abraham. All she knows is that once again she finds herself out in the desert, alone, lost, and desperate. And this time, it hasn't been her choice. She's been thrown out. And it looks like her life and the life of her son are over. Death is all she sees ahead. And then she hears the voice of the angel of the Lord speaking. And she's shown a well of water nearby. And they survive. And they thrive. And then the final episode in the story happens years later, Genesis 25. Verse 1, Abraham married Keturah. This is after Sarah's death. And they had six sons, Zimran, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Later, Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. And when Dedan grew up, he had three sons, Ashuram, Letushim, and Leumim. Midian also had five sons, Ephah, Ephor, Hanak, Abida, and Eldaah. While Abraham was still alive, he gave gifts to the sons of Hagar and Keturah. He also sent their sons to live in the east, far from his son Isaac, and 
When Abraham died, he left everything to Isaac. Abraham died at the ripe old age of 175. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him east of Hebron in Machpelah cave that was part of the field Abraham had brought, had bought from Ephraim, son of Zohar, the Hittite. Abraham was buried beside his wife, Sarah. God blessed Isaac after this, and Isaac moved to a place called the well of the living one who sees me. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Hagar, the slave woman of Sarah. Ishmael had 12 sons in this order, Nabaioth, Kedar, Abiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jetur, Nafish, Kadima. Each of Ishmael's son was a tribal chief, and a village was named after each of them. Ishmael had settled in the land east of his brothers, and his sons settled everywhere from Habila to Shur, east of Egypt on the way to Ashur. Ishmael was 137 when he died. Ishmael and Isaac meet again at Abraham's funeral. Sarah's long gone. In fact, Abraham has married a third wife and now has six more sons. It's interesting that despite Hagar's exile, Abraham is still in contact. He gives Ishmael an inheritance along with the sons of Keturah. So despite the divorce, he's still treating him as his son. The outcome is that God has been with Ishmael. In fact, he is prospered more than Isaac at this point. Remember, Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Ishmael has 12. And notice where Isaac is living. At the well at the well of the living one who sees me. Isaac has moved to the place where Hagar first met the angel of the Lord. How paradoxical is that? When God sends a messenger, an angel, into our lives, it's never for entertainment. It is because God is about to act in a way that is going to change our lives. Sometimes he preserves. Sometimes he directs. Sometimes he confronts. Sometimes he encourages. And sometimes he does all of this. In my experience, he preserved my life. And that preservation encouraged me and directed me to this day. He did the same with Hagar. In everything God does, in every situation we find ourselves, whether we would judge ourselves righteous or sinners, saved or lost, God is working on our behalf, on my behalf, on your behalf. Let that be our hope. Let that be the reality that we live in. God found Hagar in the wilderness, lost and alone, because he was always there with her. He was watching over. He was the God who sees me, and God sees you and cares about you right now. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, Keep looking up. Have a good day.